it is the most complicated machine that we have ever deployed. It was the highest power infrastructure we'd ever delivered. It is the one that broke the exascale barrier. Frontier is a huge machine. It lets you work on bigger problems than you can do anywhere else. It has more memory than any other machine. It can do the math faster. Simulating or modeling things that weren't possible in previous generations now possible with Frontier. Because the problems that we have to solve in the world continue to get harder and harder. Frontier is going to continue to drive the pursuit of the next frontier in computing. It has always been an enigma to me as to how we manage to stand up these supercomputers which mathematically you can prove should not work. For a computing system to be uh, declared that it has a certain level of uh, computing power, it needs to undergo through certain types of benchmarks, computing benchmarks. For the top 500, at least it is what we call the HPL. An acronym for High Performance Limb Pack. Folks use this standard to uh, compare performance on their machines. The idea is uh, you have these equations, a set of equations, and you need to solve them all together. So tens of millions of equations in tens of millions of unknowns. Basically it's a measure of how quickly can you solve that matrix multiply. The result at the end is how much work you did, how much size of a problem you solved, over how much time. So many moving parts in this case coming together for the first time that it made it even more challenging. If you design this to, you know, to give you this kind of capability and it, and, uh, it better give that capability, we wanted to see a number that was at least an, uh, an exaflop so that we were demonstrating that it was designed to be an exascale system and it really was. The equivalent would be as if everybody on Earth worked on the same problem at the same time with a calculator and they could do one add or multiply per second. There's eight billion people on the earth. It would take them four years to do what, what Frontier can do every second. And so that, that is what our HPL number means. More than a decade ago when the Department of Energy decided to take on this challenge, we knew that there were many hardware-related challenges to achieve that level of compute. We sat down in one of the very early meetings and we put up a huge schedule and we tried to figure out everything that could be on the critical path to getting this machine. The end point of that schedule, by the way, was having Frontier do an exaflop, right? But how do you get there? One of the big showstoppers that we ran into at that time was uh, energy consumption. We would have had to have three nuclear reactors, three gigawatts, to run that machine. Now that is never going to happen. Another big problem that we saw was uh, reliability. Calculations that we did at the time said the machine wouldn't even stay up, wouldn't run long enough to actually get a science problem done. Are there any others? Are we, you know, are those the big things we need to worry about? And it's like, no, there's some other big problems. One was parallelism. We were doing calculations for an exaflop and we said, oh my goodness, it's actually going to take a billion way parallelism. We don't even know how to get to a million way parallelism. We're only at 100,000. And so that was yet another showstopper. Everything in the system was brand new. Brand new nodes, brand new GPUs, and a custom CPU for those nodes. Bringing those technologies to fruition in a supercomputer is, is always a daunting task. In May of 2021, we were expecting delivery of components to start coming in in June with the bulk of the system coming in in late July, early August. And so I went to the factory to check on the progress of the very first high items they were making. And they said, you know, we've talked about the schedule, you know, we're, we're trying to do July, but here's a list of items that we cannot find. The list was, I don't know, 150 parts. And if you don't know when you're gonna get it, that means they can't deliver the system. And this was, quite the shock. COVID turned the world upside down, right? That's probably my number one takeaway from, from the Frontier experience is don't try to deploy a massive supercomputer during a pandemic. We needed over 60 million individual parts to build Frontier. Suddenly the supply chain constricted. It turned out not to be the GPUs, not to be the Cassini network, but were parts that go on in a lot of electronic devices, right? So the chip shortages that were affecting the automotive manufacturers 
they affected us. The stuff that we used to buy by the box full, suddenly we couldn't get them. We couldn't get drivers, we couldn't get trucks. Some parts simply were not available anymore. And so we literally had to do some redesign of parts of the machine because the parts we had designed it for simply could not be obtained, period. So we rolled up our sleeves, particularly Hewlett Packard Enterprise and Advanced Micro Devices. So this is where the supply chain people did their magic, scoured the earth basically. They were looking on eBay to try to find parts. Throughout the process, we, we lived on the edge. It was uh, one challenge at a time, one part at a time. When they got all the parts, it was a huge relief. It was like, finally, we have a system because of travel restrictions, because of COVID impacts, we ended up doing an awful lot of this with people working virtually and remotely. That was probably the biggest challenge, developing the level of trust, cooperation, and fellowship as a team when you couldn't all be together. That's what differentiates this specific team delivering and deploying leadership computing systems. And at a moment of crisis, a crisis that no one has ever faced before, that experience made the difference. We really wanted to get to the top 500 by November of 2021. So it was pretty clear that that, that was gonna be a, a Hail Mary. So picture the most elaborate complex thing you've ever taken apart and then trying to put all the pieces back and make them work and now do that on a scale of hundreds and thousands of pieces. You can't build them ahead of time and test them and then ship them and put them in place. They can only be built for the first time on site because of the tremendous amounts of infrastructure needed. The building of the, the cooling plant was probably the, the hardest part of the project. It's like you know rebuilding an airplane while you're in flight. We needed 29 megawatts of electricity to power Frontier. There's not a lot of places that you can go and plug in that type of computer. So when we start installing it, we're four months behind the original schedule, and I tell people all the time, there's not a thing you're going to do today or during this next week that's going to make up that four months, but there's a lot of things you'll do today or this week that'll cost us time. You can't build a machine like this by one person. The people who were the plumbers who put the big pipes in to carry the coolant, right? The folks who were electricians who wired it up. All those folks helped contribute to make this success. The first cabinet arrived in, in August. I knew the experience of the supercomputer after it has become operational. So now I had the privilege to observe this, how the magic happens, the behind the scenes. We would get a truck with three cabinets and a CDU. It had to come in in order also, so you have to understand that each truck that comes to the dock has to be the cabinets that's next in the line, and they have to be on the truck in the order that they need to come off the truck. Giant cabinets, which are really three cabinets combined, just roll in and they're filled. They're filled to the brim, they're 8,000 pounds, maybe, maybe more. I mean, someone's essentially rolling in a pickup truck on a, on a dolly, and, and you're watching it come in, it's incredible. Hundreds of thousands of components, grouped into thousands of nodes, put together in a number, hundreds of racks, held together by miles of cabling. 90 miles of, of cables. It was the first time all 74 cabinets had ever been assembled together. It's the first machine of its kind to be, you know, installed in the world. It's the first, you know, but it didn't work. The way it, you get science done faster is by spreading out the work over more of the compute elements or what we call nodes. At this scale, right, at the scale of about 9,000 nodes, that's hard. Basically, you have a tremendous number of processors, you know, almost 40,000 GPUs, for instance, and each of those has to uh, be able to talk to every other one. Everything is brand new, and so you're going to have some parts immediately fail. We were having lots of node failures. The network, that's always a challenge is on these. The code itself was not behaving the way we expected. We are running into issues, for example, you know, not having as many tools as we had to diagnose things. So we're sort of at a catch-up phase that we're trying to figure out. We're seeing problems, maybe a job is not performing as fast as we expected it. Why not? Every time you stand up a new supercomputer, there's always many challenges, but the biggest one remains to get the machine to work at its full capability at full scale. The system was still too immature. We were getting really fantastic results 
on a single node, on a single cabinet. But when you scaled it up to the full size of Frontier, we were pushing the bounds of the technology in very real ways. At a scale that was never experienced before. I'm naturally a pessimist. I'm an eternal optimist. Deadlines are looming, pressure is on. We have to make sure that the system runs, the system is stable, robust, while at the same time, during the nights, we had the HPL teams uh, making their runs. The question is, could we get to an exit lap? Yeah, by January, February, we were beginning to get a little bit worried. There was a very fateful meeting uh, that I had with, with Thomas Zachariah, uh, our lab director. I was told that we are not going to make the top 500. My gut reaction was that that's not acceptable. Within hours, Thomas was on the phone and was saying, we need help. That was when the Calvary came. We went from having 15 to 20 engineers on site at a time to having, you know, 50 plus engineers on site. Honestly, we're just saying, is this ever going to work? We saw a performance pattern that we had never seen on a computer before. When the job starts, you'll see a spike in power, then you'll see a plateau for a certain amount of time, and then you'll see this kind of gentle curve off at the end. We call that the tail. That's what we expected to see, but what we saw instead looked like just a triangle. It would go straight up and then straight down. It was jumping up and down a lot, kind of a sawtooth type pattern. You're losing performance every time that happens. Why on earth could that happen? There were so many unknowns, we just didn't know where to start looking. Let's come up with a list of every possible idea we have, no matter how crazy. We had about a week left. I happened to ask the right question at the right time. Essentially break the logjam that kept us from really getting close to an exaflop. He saw an anomaly in the performance of one small part of the code. Uh, debugging information that was turned on. Do we need this? No, we really don't. So we'll turn it off. And that next big run that we did went from 614 petaflops, we got up to 939 petaflops. On 8,000 nodes, not the full machine, but 8,000 nodes. Performance doubled from what we'd seen before. We are close. This time, when they started running, their goal was to run large. Over 9,000 of the nodes in the system. The power shot up and it started to run. You're starting to, to believe and then the job crashes and we'd run again, and it would fail for a different reason. Because a lot of these jobs, they would get to 99% complete after running for hours and then fail. And it was just demoralizing, you know? I would say that many of us, if not all of us, had lost hope because we were very, we were coming close, dangerously close to the deadline. And it literally came down to the 11th hour. It was the funniest thing because you've never seen so many people sitting around watching power profiles of a system. At this point, sitting in our living rooms watching these power profiles. You know, would it be six hours? Would it be ten hours? And I'd had my alarm going off every two hours. And I'd get up and, you know, the job was running and I'd sit there and watch it until it crashed. It was a long night. I think it was 5 a.m. maybe. The pattern looked correct, right? Again, you, you can recognize a good run. The graph looked Perfect. Your heart's pounding, and we're all texting each other. The messages go quiet because at this point you don't want to say anything and jinx it, right? We were living and dying by every you know drop in the power. You know, is this it? Is it going to die? This one, 99% complete, and we're all holding our breaths. This run looks like it might actually do it. And then ultimately it did finish, and and then it was waiting to see if it would pass the residual check. Finally, at 5.16 in the morning, we hit the exaflop run and it succeeded and validated. The final number was 1.102 exaflops. Immediately, the chat channels erupted, you know, virtual high fives and people began to celebrate uh, because it really was a history-making moment. I gave my iPhone to my husband and I asked him, is this a dream or is this real? You know, the sun shined again and you know, the birds chirped. It just was a fantastic feeling. It was relief that we had actually reached that, uh, that goal that we had been shooting for. And to see the culmination of all that work. And of course, it never hurts to be the first at anything. It took a bit of luck 
There is no doubt about that. But again, it speaks to the experience of the team and their hard work and commitment. Climate change and energy transitions are some of the most compelling challenges of our time. Frontier and its accomplishment represents what it means to continue to push, to, to innovate, to discover. But equally important is a secondary impact of a frontier. The kind of innovations that have had to be made in microelectronics, a completely new processor that's going to drive innovations in AI, in machine learning, but also energy efficiency. Frontier is the first massive supercomputer that scales so efficiently that it is near the top when it comes to the green 500, which is a measure of how energy efficient it is. That is a huge huge advance. We have several teams, primarily teams from the Exascale Computing Project that are working on Frontier, running their own models from astrophysics, from material science, from biology, and another one that is onboarding uh, from cancer. And these are some of the breakthroughs we're expecting to see in the next decade uh, due to Exascale Computing. I think we will reflect on, on this accomplishment, not as a technology milestone, which it is, but it's also a celebration of what human beings do, the human endeavor to, to thrive, to succeed, to do something that makes a difference, to change the world. This is time for us to start thinking about the next frontier. <laughs>